Well, hi everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's evening lecture um, from the IOP at Birmingham. Um, nice to virtually see you all again. Um, so I just wanted to plug um, a few things. Um, we, um, if you want to stay in touch uh, for future events, um, the best place to do that is on the IOP website, which you can see on the screen now, and the Birmingham website or you can um, join us on our Facebook group. So I'll remind you of all those um, at the end as well, but I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, so I think that's gone now. Nicole, was that, can you not see my screen anymore? Sorry, I can't tell. Is that gone now? Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, cool, great, thanks. Um, so tonight's lecture is um, gonna be um, from Professor Nicole Metier who um, is, joins us from the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Birmingham. Uh, she's the Head of Enterprise Engagement and Impact and the Head of Power and Infrastructure Research Group within the School of Engineering. Um, she's also the Deputy Director for Sensors of the UKC RIC National Road Infrastructure Facility at Birmingham. Um, she leads the Geophysics Work Package for the Birmingham Quantum Technologies Hub for Sensors and Timing, um, and that's what she's going to talk to us about this evening. So we're very excited um, about that. Um, just a few things for the audience while Nicole sets up her slides. Um, we welcome your questions. We'll save them all up to the end. And to do that, you should be able to um, uh, click on the questions button and type your questions in. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll read them out to Nicole um, and then she'll be able to answer them. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Kat. Um, a warm welcome for me too um, for this evening lecture. Um, I'd just like to clarify that this, as it says in the title, it's a civil engineer's perspective of the world and especially with respect to quantum technology sensing. So, so bear with me um, as we go through, because I'm just trying to show you what, um, wh where we are coming in from a civil engineering viewpoint and what's important for me, but why I also think this um, collaboration is so exciting. But let's take a step back before I do this and actually talk a bit about my career, because I think if some of you are thinking of what to do, I think this is actually quite important. So this is this is me. Um, I always enjoyed maths, physics, chemistry. I also enjoyed a lot of sports um, and I was always quite good at it. And I thought, what do I what do I want to do? And one of the problems my parents had is that I wasn't very good at German. Um, so I failed German dictations, I failed German literature and I also actually failed my English um, assessments. So there was this big question mark of what do I do with my career with, with those um, subjects that I really liked, but also those subjects that I really didn't like. So what I decided to do initially, um, up until I was around 16, I really wanted to do maths um, or then applied maths because the applied maths was a bit more practical. So I thought that was really fun. But then what you do in Germany, you actually do some work experience. And I was lucky enough to do my work experience at the University of Hanover in the um, department or institute of um, fluid mechanics. And in there, I got really excited about coastal engineering and decided that civil engineering might actually be the right thing for me to do. So from that point onwards, my ambition in life was really to do one thing. And I'm not sure how much you know about the German coastline, but this is a, a view of part of the German coastline. So this is um, pointing towards Denmark. But what it was, it was really that, that one island called Zut. Um, which is quite a narrow island. It's basically like a wave breaker in front of the main coastline. But what happens there is that we have got issues with erosion. So that's sediment transport, that's the sand being washed away. And so my aim in life was really to save this island initially. But that was sort of me age 16 and that's what I decided. So I decided I was gonna do civil engineering, but obviously before then I needed to finish my A-levels in Germany. I then did my university degree. I did that in, at the University of Hanover in Germany. But I actually did one year of Erasmus at the time because that was um, offered to me at the University of Birmingham. So that was really quite good. Um, and I would wholeheartedly recommend um, spending some time abroad if you can. So my passion there was still for coastal engineering. That has never changed, but something else came in and that's called underground construction and specifically tunneling. So I was really quite excited. How do you construct something in a sort of natural environment, which is quite difficult um, to predict? Um, how do you build your tunnels? And this is where a lot of my work later came from um, that I will talk to you about in this presentation. But I still stuck with my coastal engineering. So my PhD was actually in coastal engineering at the University of Birmingham. 
And, but then I stayed on to become a postdoc. I did actually go back to Germany, but didn't last very long there because I didn't enjoy it um, there that much. So then went back, um, came back here, did my postdoc um, at Birmingham. But that was already in mainly what we call buried assets. And I will show you some pictures what I mean by that. And um, I've basically been an academic at Birmingham ever since 2010. So that's a bit of background um, about me. So let's actually come to my actual talk. So here's a brief overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an idea of what a civil engineering world looks like or civil engineers world look like, and especially from the viewpoint of buried assets. So anything that's below the ground surface. Talk a bit about existing technologies and how they work and their detectability of buried assets. But then obviously come to microgravity sensing and also the quantum technology sensing and where it is different and why it's so exciting. So let's start, um, just give, give you a bit of a, just go back one step, just very briefly give you an overview of what civil engineering is all about, um, because it's very broad. So I've already mentioned coastal engineering, so that's sediment transport, protecting coastlines, but you've got um, your bridge engineering, your structural engineering, You've got your roads and highways, um, you've got wind engineering, so that's a lot of fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics um, around buildings. If you're ever in the civil engineering laboratory, you can actually see a, um, a model of campus and we have some wind flow measurements around that model. Um, it's geotechnical engineering and geotechnical engineering is anything to do with the ground, looking through the ground. You've got your tunneling, I've already mentioned this, that's obviously also ground related. You've got railway engineering, which we're also very strong at in Birmingham. But really where a lot of my talk fits into is the sort of tunneling geotechnical engineering side. So one of the things um, um, I always think about is do we actually really know where things come from? So where does our water come from? Where does our gas come from? Where does the electricity come from? And I don't mean this through the plug or so. How does it actually get there? How does it get to your house? Similar with the broadband. Where, where is that actually, where, where is it? How does it um, get to your property? So if you think about it, these are some pictures I've taken and some of my colleagues have taken. This is the sort of world um, of the subsurface, the underground. This is generally what we don't see, but I actually like, like um, or enjoy looking into holes. And that's where all these pictures are taken from. Some, as you can see, have some construction fences in front of, front of you, it's on the next slide. But these are all where we've excavated, where we've um, unearthed the buried infrastructure. And you can see some bigger pipes. So you can see um, a, a, a bigger pipe here, um, that's a gas pipe. You can see some smaller pipes um, here. These are basically ducts. There's electricity cable and probably um, broadband, so optical fibers in there. You've got um, some pipes here, the water ones are, tend to be the blue ones. So quite complicated and it's not all very linear, as you can see. Here's another image of, um, again, a similar idea. You can see different materials, you see plastic, you can see um, some metal. Um, these were even taken in different countries. Um, the only thing I should say is the straight one that you see is actually taken in Germany. I'm not saying everything is so rudimentarily straight and linear in Germany, but I thought that was quite interesting that that was actually very um, straight and there are not too many uh, cr um, cross sections and not too changes in cross section and not too many divergence from the straight. Um, the one down here, interesting enough, that that was taken in Switzerland. Um, so again, um, maybe not so uh, country stereotypical. But these are sort of pipes and cables that's buried in the ground and we call that shallow. Um, so that generally means it's within the top one meter. And from the, some of those pictures, you can guess that that's what, where it is. But what else is in the ground? So we've got underground um, car parks. Um, so this is an example. So you've got underground car parks. You've got um, things like here, what we call pile foundations, but it's generally your foundations of your buildings. It's also buried in the ground. You could have um, storage tanks, disused storage tanks. So that could be often at um, what we call brownfield sites. So in areas where um, there might have been um, factories there or even petrol stations where you've got underground storage tanks. I've already mentioned this is a picture of tunnels and you again you can see some um, examples of the pile foundations. So there's quite a lot of different assets down there. 
But the other thing that we are concerned about is things like this, they're called sinkholes. Um, they might be natural occurrences or because there was a structure in there. So you can see in the bottom um, left one, this is, this is most likely as a result of a mine shaft here. This is why that collapse happened. But it can also happen when water dissolves some of the ground, some of the material. And um, then you get um, a void, and if your road or your surface covering can't span that void, it collapses. So it sinkholes. Clearly, in an ideal world, we want to detect these, we want to find these before they uh, materialize on the surface. But that's quite challenging because we don't really know where they are. The other thing is, I've already mentioned this, our mines, our mine shafts. Um, we've got quite a legacy in this country and other countries about mine workings. And again, we don't really know exactly where they are. Similar, similar um, statement applies to pipes and cables. We also don't really know where they are. We have what's called statutory records, so information from the utility companies but they might be out of date, they might not be very accurate. So we just don't know where a lot of things that we can't see where they are hidden. And it's a bit out of mind, um, out of sight, out of mind approach a lot of the times. So let's think of what the tools of the trade are for a civil engineer. So um, again, this is a bit different to a often a physics laboratory. We use um, excavators. So you've got large size excavators, you've got mini excavators, and obviously when there's something in the ground and they hit it, they can damage it, there can be a, a risk to safety, but also it can um, cause lots of delays to your project. We're not just using mechanical excavation, we're also using hand digging. Um, you can see some shovels at the bottom, because again, we have to dig very carefully around the buried assets because we don't want to damage those. So really what this is leading to is that if we have a good knowledge of what's there, we can actually simplify a lot of our work as a civil engineer. So what are we really worried about? Um, as a civil engineer, we're really worried about the sort of strength and density of the ground, because the stronger the ground is, it helps us with our foundations, it helps us with our tunnels, it helps us with our surfaces, our roads. So we really need to know how strong our ground is. We often need to know where bedrock is, so where it's not where it changed from the soil to rock, um, because again, that's quite important when we want to construct in the ground, but also again for our foundations. We need to know where our buried objects are. So, as I said, I've shown you the pipes and cables, but everything that's in the ground, we need to know where it is, so we can either avoid it, we can remove it, or we can plan around it. But really, from a civil engineering viewpoint, the ground poses the biggest risk to any construction activity. And that means um, that it is the biggest cause of overruns, of um, injuries um, on, on a project site. Clearly, we try to avoid it as much as we can, but we know it's, it's the one thing that um, is the biggest risk. But we can do something about it. So we don't just take it as in, oh, the ground is a risk and we can't do anything. No, of course we don't. So there are some methods and measures that we can take to overcome this uncertainty. So the first one of these is what we call intrusive measures, where we do a site and ground um, investigation. And again, what we actually do is we try and collect some of the soil. And there are different ways of collecting the soil. One is to dig trial pits. So that's what you see in the bottom left, you see a trial pit, and we try to collect that soil, basically take it, take it back to the laboratory. Um, sometimes it's quite interesting, you can actually feel, if you get the soil in your hand, you can actually get quite a lot of information about it um, if you've got some experience. You can also take cores, so you can bore down, um, you can drill down and you can take some cores, which again, you can take back to the lab, and that helps you um, find some information. But the key thing is with this method is you get really detailed information, but only about the bit that you've dug up. So everything around it, you don't know that much about. And that's that's a real problem because you can't you just can't physically dig up, dig up the whole area where your project is. If you think, for example, HS2 is a very long linear project, so they can't dig up the whole route um, and they can't even take lots of boreholes along the whole route. They've already taken a, a large number, but there has to be a balance. How much can you dig up? 
And clearly, to say, even the digging process in its own right obviously poses a risk. So we still need to know really very accurately what's there so we can avoid it. Another measure um, that we can take is the use of geophysics. And this is, this is a picture that um, a, a colleague of mine has put together and just shows a number of different geophysical instrumentation that we use. And, and you also see it at, at different landmarks and different surface areas. So we've got in the, in the middle here, um, we've got something called a Syntrix. That's actually a gravity measurement. And that's a bit akin to the quantum technology sensor we'll be talking about. You've got EM conductivity. So that measures a, a conductivity. You've got what's called a ground penetrating radar. So down, down here is a ground penetrating radar. But you also see um, how people work in, in very different environments of hanging off buildings. The building wants to look um, through the um, surface of the building material, to look behind it, maybe to look for corrosion, maybe to look at reinforcement bars. Um, so there's quite a lot that you can do with the geophysics. And here's an example where geophysics was applied. This is a, a brownfield site, and this was investigated. Um, this, this was investigated. Um, and we put a lot of geophysics on there. In this case, it was a frequency domain um, electromagnetic that was looked into to investigate that brownfield site. And you can create images like this that look very colorful, but then you have to interpret this. What does this mean? So what can we actually see from these slides? There is a long linear feature, which long linear always means it's a pipe, it's a cable. So there's an indication that there's a pipe on this side. There are still some foundations um, on the site, and there's also possible um, indication that there's some increased fluid. So that could be a leakage from a storage tank, you don't know. So you still have to interpret this. But if you go back to the slide before, so if we look at that, you didn't see anything at the surface. And it's only when you applied the geophysics that it revealed quite a lot about the subsurface. Going okay, forwards again. So coming back to what the soil actually looks like, just, just to go back to the more the sort of geotechnical aspect and actually try and consider why some of these sensing technologies have limitations, why it is so difficult. So most of the techniques that we use um, rely on electromagnetic waves to travel through the ground. But what does the ground compose of? Um, you might think it's a homogeneous material. So in this example, you've got a pipe um, buried at some depth and you've got your soil. But what the soil is actually made of is of different materials. And here you can see two different examples of two different materials. The top one is a sand, the gray one is a sand, and the bottom one, the sort of orangey reddy color is a clay. And you can see some of the difference, but also some of the things that are important to um, notice. So with the sand, you actually see quite a few gaps between the particles. These gaps can be either filled by water or they can be filled by air. And that, again, makes actually quite a difference. The other thing you can notice that with the clay at the bottom, this is a specific type of clay, you get more sort of plates, um, platelets. And what that means is you've got a, a very high surface area. And that reacts with water slightly differently. So if you then look at a um, zoomed in image of a, a, a few soil grains, you, in this case, it's got water in between the soil grains. There is um, the, and, and the water can have two different characteristics. One is what we call free water, and the other one is what we call bound water. And the difference is that the, the free water, as it says, is literally between the pore particles or the grain particles in the pores, while the bound water, because remember, water is a dipole, so the bound water is, is bound to the charges of the soil particles. And that generally tends to happen with the finer material, your clays. So that's quite important. Because what you then have is you've got a sensor, in this case, maybe a so-called ground penetrating radar. It sends this electromagnetic wave through the ground. But that electromagnetic wave, because you've got this water, the reaction of the dipole, um, it will actually attenuate. So it will change in um, amplitude, might also change in wavelength, but 
but really if it hits a, um, a, a buried asset, it will get reflected off this. But how deep your wave penetrates into the ground very much depends on what your ground is. So what I've shown you is a very idealized condition, but this is not what you might have. So if we go back, so I've already said it's mainly um, a electromagnetic wave. It's affected by the soil comp composition and the properties. So sand is different to clay, and you've maybe seen this in the little images. It's affected by the amount of and the type of water in the ground. So I've already mentioned that water has um, is a dipole, so it's got charges on the surface, and they react um, with with the charges of the ground particles. It's also affected by the material the target is made of. So what I showed you was a possibly a plastic pipe because we always um, show a, a blue pipe tends to be the new materials, the plastics. But traditionally it would be cast iron, so more the metallic um, material. And that makes a difference to how easy or not it is to, um, to detect it, because it, it basically matters whether the target is a conduit in its own right. So what you can actually have, so this um, is a picture of a ground penetrating radar at the surface, and it actually matters whether the ground is dry or the ground is wet. And what, what matters is how deep your signal can actually penetrate into the ground. So that's quite important. So anything that's based on sort of electromagnetic um, signals is affected by this. So let's go and have a look at the sort of detectability of our existing technologies and see um, what um how deep they can go so what we've done is we've done a bit of a like a thought experiment where we assume we've got a target of one meter diameter or radius um, of half a meter it's buried at some nominal depth below the ground surface in this case um the the depth changes but the and the target feature the radius also changes and we've basically done a broad brush approach to see how much the different, what the sort of optimal de detection range is for the different sensing technologies. So if we look at electromagnetic ground conductivity, um, so what you see on, on this is um, the, the graph on the right hand side shows on the x axis shows the diameter of the feature in meters. And on the y-axis shows the depth um, below the ground surface. And you can see that um, the um, EM ground conductivity is really good um, in a certain range, quite shallow. Um, so quite large diameters, relatively shallow. So the dashed is always an indication of uncertainty. But really, it's quite a good method to for these sort of, as I said, upper five meters. It really can't go much deeper and has really no penetration below seven meters. If we do the same thing now for ground penetrating radar, you, you can see that it has a slightly um, deeper um, detectability potentially, but um, and also can detect some smaller features. But one of the things to note in, in this is um, that this is an ideal conditions. You might have under some certain conditions when you've got a lot of clay and like we obviously live in Birmingham, there's quite a lot of clay, London there's quite a lot of clay, it might only penetrate a few centimetres and that's part of the problem of these sensing technologies. But in theory it's got an excellent resolution and it actually has an excellent horizontal and vertical accuracy. So you can position it very accurately when you walk around the surface, it's basically like pushing a lawnmower, you can very accurately detect where you are. But it could have limited depth penetration, as it says, sometimes none. It very much depends on what the ground is like in this instance. You've got um, direct electrical resist, uh, direct current electrical resistivity. So this is where we put probes in the ground and induce an electric current in the ground. And again, in ideal conditions, you can see that it has excellent depth penetration, could actually be up to 200 meters. It very much depends how far apart I'm putting these electrodes um, that, that I put in the ground. But it has a limited horizontal and vertical accuracy and also a limited resolution. So with the resolution, it's always the target feature, the size of the dark target feature that I can resolve. 
So then what microgravity, um, it's actually something we're using. Um, there's a classical instrument. So microgravity um, is really affected by the different um, densities, the different bulk densities. And um, in the soil, I can have different bulk densities because of different materials, but also because I've got um, different features that I'm trying to detect. It's um, so what a microgravity survey is really trying to do, it's trying to detect changes, um, differentiations, and it's changes to um, sort of anomalous densities by collecting surface measurements of the Earth gravitational field. So what we do is we take relative measurements, we tend to do a grid or we do a line, and we look what the variation is. It's, it's really a highly sensitive instrument, um, but it measures acceleration due to gravity. So it's similar to uh, Newton's experiment with the apple falling off the tree. This is a sort of a schematic of, of what a classical instrument looks like. It's basically a mass on a spring. And what we are doing is that that mass is attracted by, uh, so it's, it's pulled stronger or less strong by depending what's in the ground. And that gives you an expansion of your, um, so extension of your spring, and that's what you measure. So when it's um, when there's denser material in the ground in, in a certain area, then what I will get is a positive gravity anomaly. So in my graph, I will get a positive signal. If it's a, um, a low density feature, so anything an air filled void, a, a cavity, I will get a density. I will get a low because it's basically not attracted that much. There's a sort of mass missing. But one of the problems I have is the challenge of what we call non-uniqueness. So what this means is I'm really measuring the gravitational field for the whole um, vertical, um, basically to the depth um, of the center of the Earth, uh, theoretically. So it's an average. So unlike my electromagnetic um, techniques, where they rely on reflection of an asset, this is not relying on a reflection. So this is basically measuring an average. And then you have to try and use some clever mathematics um, called inversion to find out what this might be a result of. So is this as a result of something small, shallow, um, or is it something deeper, but um, so bigger, but deeper? Um, and that could, um, that could manifest itself in the same way on, on your measurement. So that's quite a, a challenge. Here you can see one of my postdocs taking some measurements um, as he was out in the field. Again, this is a brownfield site. You can see the standard classical instruments um, called a Syntrix. So these, these boxes here, these are actually the older type. There's a slightly newer type, looks almost identical. It's a bit more squat, but you can see it um, later on. But why we're doing gravity is because of this issue that the soil is um, at, that the soil attenuates the signal, as I've expressed earlier, due to the um, charges with the soil itself, soil particles themselves, but also the water, and therefore the depth um, that some of these other sensing technologies can penetrate to is limited, and this is um, not the case with gravity. The, one of the challenges you have also is that um, when we talk about soil, um, soil varies very um, quickly. Um, so there is no, no real homogeneous um, soil. And therefore, um, some of these changes you pick up with some of the other sensing technologies um, quite easily. But we think with gravity, the variations are not quite as big. And therefore, again, gravity might be um, the sensing type of choice for us. So really, the, the biggest limitation we have at the moment is the resolution of the instruments themselves. So what's the smallest feature they can resolve um, when they look through the ground? One thing we should um, keep in mind, and I haven't got this on, on one of the slides, is that basically think of the um, signal looking at sort of, it's, it's like a cone penetration. So if that's my sensor at the top, so it's like a cone penetration. So this is depth. So the deeper you go, the bigger your feature has to be that you can resolve. And that's where the current limitation is of what we can actually see in the ground. So here's another example, and you can see how you can again uh, image um, some of these results. So you can show it in a colorful um, ISO, ISO plot. 
And again, you can simulate your blues, which often is, is a low density and the sort of warmer colors are high density. And then you still have to interpret what this is as a result of. But when we put this back into our traditional plot, you can come up with something like this, where you have, in theory, no um, depth is not the limit, but you have limited horizontal accuracy um, because, again, you, it's, it's not a simple reflection. You've also got a, um, a depth to, to calculate your exact depth, and the inversion is, is one of the challenges. But it sometimes is your best option, especially if you've got very conductive soil, where a lot of the electromagnetic sensing technologies just simply won't work. If you put this together now, you end up with a picture like this, where you can see a lot of um, zones um, that are colored um, in, in different colors. But what you also see is that the sort of smaller features or something lower down, there isn't currently a suitable sensing technologies that might detect these. And also keep in mind that this is ideal um, scenario, ideal conditions. But we might actually have conditions that are not so suitable for, um, for some of the sensing technologies. So does this mean if we have a quantum technology gravity instrument, it solves all my problems because it's, it's more sensitive? Um, well, it doesn't solve all my problems. It solves some of my problems. Um, and one of the problems I still have is related to noise. And with noise, we refer to anything that is not the signal of interest. So what we normally do when we have um, a gravity instrument, so this is not uh, limited to quantum, this is any gravity instrument. We have your instrument reading, that instrument, so if it's a, if it's a spring in this case, the, it will actually drift over time um, because um, in, it changes with temperature, so it will drift. Um, so you have to correct for that. You have to correct for your what's called free air anomaly. So basically where you are with respect to sea level, you have to correct this. You have to also correct um, your um, terrain. You have to do a terrain correction. And then you ultimately come up with your image. And the fact that that's really quite important is given in the next example. So if we look at this, this is actually a, a real, this is a, a real, um, this real data. This was taken where, where I said my postdoc was doing the survey on the brownfield site. And don't worry about the details, but you can see sort of what's indicated as high and low density values um, on the image. But one of the things that we had, we had a large cliff face on one side. So this is a digital terrain model of the cliff face. And you can see that the cliff face was around 15 meters high. So really quite steep. And as you can imagine, that's a mass. And the mass itself will attract um, the, um, the, the mass in, in the instrument. So therefore, because of that attraction, you get slightly different measurements. So you have to correct for this. And then you get um, something like this, which is your terrain corrected uh, model. And you can see things have slightly changed and the positions have slightly changed. As I said, you still have to interpret this, but it does show you how important your terrain correction is. I'm not going to talk much about quantum mechanics because, as I said, this is, after all, this uh, civil engineering's viewpoint. But one of the things we use within our quantum technology instrument is um, the principle of superposition. So you might have heard of uh, Schrodinger's cat um, that can be uh, alive um, or dead at the same time. There's also something called quantum entanglement, which um, where you have uh, basically two particles joined together or you can't differentiate them when you, um, when you try to uh, look at them. But there's a lot more about this. So this is, as I said, this is not a lecture about quantum mechanics. So I'm just trying to say that these are sort of principles we are using. So with our quantum instrument, we are still basically, it's, it's still based on gravity, it's still Newton's apple falling and trying to measure how gravity, how a mass in the ground affects um, our fall. Um, one of the things we do do is um, we have this, um, the idea that we use our interferometry. So we've basically got our atoms, which are our mass. So we replace the, the mass on the spring that we saw before, and the, the mass is now replaced by atoms. They tend to be rubidium atoms, and your spring is, is replaced by a laser. And what we do is we basically measure how um, those atoms are affected by different um, density in the ground. 
it's a bit more complicated. And one of the things that we are trying to actually do is use it is a so-called gradiometer um, um, setup. You can see that in the middle where we've not just got one um, mass in essence, so one location where we um, trap our atoms and interrogate them, we've got two. And the big difference between having the two is that we can take the difference and some of the common noise sources um, disappear then, and that's really quite important. Here's an image um, of a just a gravimeter, so this has just got one, um, this has just got one um, location where we trap the atoms, um, one chamber. So you can see the rubidium atoms there. At that stage, they still have quite a high kinetic energy, so we have to cool them down, and we also have to trap them in a vacuum so that they don't move so much. We do this with, with sort of lasers. Then we can throw them up, or we can actually also drop them. In this video, we're throwing them up. We then um, inject them, or we, we then um, pu push a laser light on them, and what that does is using the quantum effect, and it separates these. So this is where you have the quantum superposition. So it separates them, has got some on, on a certain energy stage and some other atoms on a different energy level. It then um, basically monitors how they are affected by um, the gravitational pull. You have another laser, you bring them both together and um, you can basically then do what's called interferometry. So it's a bit like um, looking at two waves. Um, it's like light. You can look at how they, um, what, what the difference is, and you can actually infer quite a lot of information from that. One of the big challenges, though, is the miniaturization. And um, this, this has been some time ago, so we've done this within the university. Um, this, is, this is the work of my physics colleagues. And the, the challenge has been to bring it from a laboratory instrument to a much smaller instrument to something that we can then use in the field. Just to show again what a classical instrument looks like. So on the right hand side, it's a classical gravimeter. So and on the um, so on the left hand side, it's a classical gravimeter. On the right hand side, it's still a classical gravimeter, but it's got a specific stand. And this shows three um, on top of each other. So that's basically like a gradiometer configuration. Here you see the quantum technology equivalent. Um, so on the a left hand side, it's the gravimeter. You can see I've highlighted in red because it's the, the color might not come out that easily or clearly. It's um, a much smaller tube, whereas on the right hand side, you can show, you can see the much taller tube together with also the classical instrument in front of it. So you've got some size comparison. And just to emphasize again, what's really exciting is that with the gradiometer assessment in the quantum instrument is that a lot of common noise sources are suppressed and disappear. And this is much more so in the um, quantum instrument because we're using the same, uh, same laser as a ruler. Whereas on the classical instrument, at least on the classical example, you've got separate instruments. They all have slightly different drift. They all have slightly different spring constants, they react slightly differently. Um, so it sometimes can be quite difficult to synchronize those, whereas you don't have that worry at all with the um, quantum instrument. The other advantage with the um, gradiometer, the quantum technology gradiometer, is that your vertical alignment doesn't have to be as accurate as it has to be with the classical instruments. So the classical instrument, you have to be within one arc second, so that's very difficult to align vertically. And especially on a muddy field, it can be quite difficult um, to do because uh, your instrument just tilts all the time. Just to sort of um, give you a, a quick hint of what you end up doing and how you actually end up with a gravity gradiometer value, you've got um, those two atom clouds um, separated by a distance of what we call a baseline between the two clouds. You can measure the peak height um, between the two clouds. You can basically then um, you can basically create an ellipse, but um, using that data and based on the angle or the slope of that ellipse, you can actually work out what your gravity gradiometer um, signal is or value is. 
you can already see that that's quite challenging because you can see some outliers. So how do you decide on what's the most appropriate um, ellipse that's formed by the green dots? And that's something we are, we're still looking into. So that's, that's work in progress. Just to show you again what we do as a civil engineer on site, this is with a classical instrument. You can see we started at 2.30 in the afternoon. So the classical instrument has moved on the sleepers. This is a, a time lapse video. It's again by some of my postdocs and PhD students, so they're moving it. Um, and it, there's quite a lot of other measurements going on in parallel. Uh, you also need to know exactly where it's positioned all the time. But within, so this is sort of going to come to an end in a minute. Um, so you can see there's a lot of standing around. So this is 4.50, so in two hours 20, we've probably covered around 10, 10 to 15 meters. So you can actually see how slow a classical instrument is. But what this allow us is actually to assess what's the potential if we use the classical instrument and what, what happens if we then model, if we had a much faster instrument, a much better, more sensitive instrument, what can we suddenly see? So here are some examples of what we saw. We were looking, this was on the railway side, so at the top is the railway. We were looking at a culvert um, at the bottom here. This, this is called a culvert. And what we actually found is that, well, that there was an underpassage that um, they didn't know about. So that red dashed line is underpassage, and that actually gives you the bigger signal. So this is a low, a gravity low, which is what we would expect. Um, this is negative, so it's a slightly reverse, so gravity low. And that gave us a much bigger signal than the one we were actually interested in. Another example that you might not have thought of that um, engineers are interested in and we could use these instruments for is actually for um, animal um, sets and to look at animal burrows. So in this case, this is still the same experiment. We knew there were some badger sets uh, in the vicinity and that can be quite problematic for civil engineering projects because if we don't know exactly where they are, um, we, it might delay our projects, it might be quite costly, there might be um, a, a time where you can't interfere with the animals, so again it's really important to know where they are. So here's an example, and we've used two different data sources, the top one, and that's typical of a ground penetrating radar, it's just really difficult to interpret, you get squiggly lines. And there, it's, it's really not very clear, but there might be some indication where the two red arrows are, that there might be something in the data, so that's here and, and here. We then also did a microgravity survey, and again, it's quite noisy, you can't really quite tell, but there is a bit of a low there, a low there, you might argue there's a low here as well. But what we were doing is we were really trying to combine it with our ground penetrating radar data to confirm um, the absence or the, or the presence of um, some of the badger sets possible um, locations. And um, we think that that actually confirmed that using sort of a multi-sensor approach is, is quite useful uh, in any case, but it also showed the potential of microgravity data and microgravity surveys. I appreciate this is a really complicated figure, but this is was doing something similar, but using uh, microgravity, which is a top, top figure, and using resistivity at the bottom figure. And again, it's trying to verify some of the indications that you get from the different data. And again, this was probably uh, indicating that there were some changes in construction. So this was for an embankment, so slightly different. Um, this was a canal embankment we were looking into. And we wanted to know whether there was any water flow through the embankment. And again, trying to look at combining the different data sets is really useful. But as you can see, this is not easy. This is still quite interpretive. Looking at um, where does this all get us, so if, if you live around Birmingham or know Birmingham well, you know that there's the black country, there are lots of mine shafts, and I've already said um, that we don't really know much about our mine workings. And on the right hand side, it just shows all the number of mines that are recorded just north of Birmingham. And if we have a quantum instrument, we can suddenly detect something that is the same size, twice, at, twice the depth, or half the size at the same depth. And that suddenly brings in quite a lot of the mine shafts that we're really interested in. So your four meter diameter, 10 to 12 meters, or probably more interestingly, the sort of slight, slightly smaller diameter, your two meter diameter at a depth of five to seven meters. 
So just in summary, what um, traditional microgravity measurements are, just to give you a bit of a feel, it's really like measuring the length of the British Isles to an accuracy of 10 millimetres. Whereas once we use our quantum technology instruments, it's doing the same thing to an accuracy of 10 micrometers. So much smaller, much more accurate. We can resolve much finer detail. So in, in summary, um, unknown ground condition poses a real big risk to construction sites. We have a range of geophysical sensors to detect buried objects, but they have limitations in terms of penetration and resolution. Gravity sensors are often the best alternative, but current, current um, surveys are very slow. You've seen the picture with the railway. And a um, quantum instrument, a gra gravity gradiometer, should overcome this because it doesn't need such a careful vertical alignment, for example. So they should really make a huge difference. Our initial results are really promising. Um, but one thing that we've really come to value as part of the work is that cross-disciplinary work is absolutely vital. And as you can see from my example, you can actually work within the quantum technology community without a degree in physics. I've shown you quite a lot about the sort of really high level, um, very, very intricate um, instrumentation. But as civil engineers, um, I'm obviously always interested in doing trials. So just to, just to show you that we also have a nice um, new laboratory to play with on, on campus, which is called the National Buried Infrastructure Facility. And really what this is, it's got lots of office space and so on, but um, what it also has, it's a big pit, or as some of my colleagues say, a big swimming pool. But really what this is, we can split it into base, but we can actually bury our objects ourselves. We can um, control our ground conditions. We control, control our loading. We can control our water. And that's really good because we can hopefully then evaluate our quantum technology instruments um, very carefully in there. It's due to open uh, in the next few months. Um, just to give you an, uh, in a bit of an indication on size, so it's 25 meters long, 10 meters wide, 5 meters deep, um, although it's got a movable floor in the middle, which is up to 6 meters deep. Um, so there it's really to simulate tunneling um, effects as well. So you can already see this is an example from a different lab in Canada, but you can really vary some really large scale um, objects in, in the ground and you can control your density and all your ground conditions very carefully. You can also simulate loading from the surface like car loading or so. And, and I want to finish off by really thanking all my colleagues, postdocs and PhD students and all the industry I've worked with. As you can imagine, the minute you put a list up, um, you will have forgotten someone. So apologies to anybody you have forgotten. Thank you to everyone you have forgotten and also you have listed. And a lot of my work couldn't have been done with a lot of um, support from industry. So again, I may have missed some logos, but hopefully I've, I've covered most of them. So thanks to everyone. And um, hopefully this was an interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. That was that was so interesting and and so um, wonderful to hear how such an abstract physics concept can be um, have such a practical application that affects all of our lives. Um, so we've got time for questions. So if you have them, um, you should be able to click the question box at the top um, and then just type your question and and then I'll be able to uh, read them out. Um, so um, maybe we can start. Just um, I'm interested in how this collaboration came about with the physicists. Did, did you like know about the fact that they were working on, on these kind of quantum gravity sensors and you said, oh, I, I want to use this, or did they open the floor to any, any uses of their technologies? How did it happen? It was probably a serendipity um, um, meeting between um, the, the PI or the head of the quantum technology hub, so Kai Bongs, uh, as well as a colleague of mine in engineering. Uh, they were one of those, um, I don't know, uh, some of those more senior meetings where they were just talking about their work and they basically just said, we're really trying to find anything that's in the ground and it's really challenging because all the, the soil is so critical and it's so difficult to see through. And then Kai said, ah, I might have a solution for you. I've got <laughs> an instrument that I'm working on, I'm developing that does, doesn't worry about um, all these, um, the, the soil conditions, because it's ju just looking at an uh, absence or an existence of, of something in the ground. 
And um, that's how it started, is probably going back now 10 years, um, but we've sort of did, did some preliminary um, investigations and it's built up from there. Well, great. Um, it seems crazy that um, there's just so much under our feet that we don't know. Are there not laws about what can like go where and, and records and that kind of thing? There are nominal laws where you should put your pipes and cables, but often <laughs> that's not where the space is. Because keep in mind that um, we've got in London, we've still got Victorian um, drainage, Victorian sewers in the ground. We even have a Roman sewer in London still in the ground. So I think expecting that our statutory records are up to date and accurate <laughs> um, historically, the sort of legacy, I think is, is quite challenging. Also, you might have positioned it relative to a, a street corner or lamppost or fence post, they, which no longer exist. So we have really old statutory um, assets in the or we've got really old assets in the ground, and we just don't really have the records. Yes, when we put something in now, we should uh, record it better. But uh, again, even when we have like brownfield sites, like the one I showed you, which looked like sort of just sand at the surface. There's no, no, it's not compulsory that you necessarily record what's below the ground and also that company might have moved on or so. It's just, the, so, some work has been done to aid this data sharing and aid it, but at the moment it's really difficult. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, for the output of your scans, does it require a physicist to interpret the results or can a civil engineer kind of understand the results as they, as they come out? I think we can understand the results. I think at the moment it still needs the physicist to operate the instrument, but it um, an engineer can definitely interpret the data. Um, so we still need the physicist, but we are working very hard on making it such that it's it's similar to what we use now. It's it's basically almost a bit of a black box. Um, and I think while it's important to have some understanding of how the instruments work, even the existing instruments, we are definitely moving towards the, the um, sort of that practitioners, engineers, geophysicists can operate these instruments in the future. Um, what's the strangest thing you found underground? What's the strangest thing I found? Um, not sure there was. Um, I think we've we've I, th I think it's not it's not really strange. I mean we've found some bones or so, but that's not archaeological. I mean you can use some of the instrument for archaeological digs. So one of the earlier projects we worked with at, uh, at Stonehenge when they were looking at um, other uh, remains there. So I think that was really quite interesting where they looked at sort of where they found like Woodhenge. So we've we've worked on that a bit, but um, otherwise I think not that much surprising. What is surprising is sometimes just how complex our networks are below ground. When you think it's a pipe, it's a straight line, and it's far from it being a straight line. Great, thanks. Um, do you see significant improvements coming in the next few years? And if so, what would you like them to be? Oh, that's a very open-ended question, I guess. Um, so I think there's significant improvements, obviously, from our centre development. So I think um, the my colleagues in, in physics are working very hard to make the instruments more mobile, so that they are much more like a um, lawnmower type thing, so you can take a measurement as you move along, but also to miniaturise it, to make it smaller, to maybe put it on a drone, to um, just yeah, miniaturise it. Um, that's from the technology side. I think from the interpretation side, there's a lot of um, things happening with AI and machine learning. So artificial intelligence and machine learning to interpret the data um, a bit more cleverly than we currently do. And from a sort of civil engineering viewpoint, there is a drive to develop a national underground asset register, which is driven by the Geospatial Commission to really pull initially just the sort of pipes and cables together, but then hopefully other assets such as disused mine shafts or, or tanks or foundations could also go onto that same platform in the future. Great. Uh, I've had a few related questions about the, the price and, and when it might be commercially viable. So um, some people said, though, it looks quite, quite expensive. What, what do you think the timeline will be for it being available more commercially? I think at, 
I mean, because the so oh, sorry, that wasn't a good answer. Um, we're working very hard with industry, so we've got a, a supply chain, um, and we're basically doing the knowledge transfer to industry to then have commercial products available. I think at the moment they will be. Um, the, the aim is in the medium term to have them the same price tag as the classical instrument, and that is in the order of hundred thousand um, pounds. It tends to be mainly a, a, a loan instrument, so a higher instrument, so companies don't tend to own it. Um, but again, the the vision thereafter is to have it in the size, in the sort of price bracket of a ground penetrating radar, which is sort of your 15 to 30,000 pounds, depending which one you're picking. And then ultimately to maybe end up in the thousand pounds, but I think that is sort of tens of years away, whereas hopefully the um, same price bracket as the current instrument is maybe, I don't know, maybe anything sort of around five years away, um, may, maybe a bit more, it just, just depends. It's, it's a sort of a market pull, market push um, challenge. But then sort of, I don't know, 10, 15 years maybe to have it in the price bracket of a, a ground penetrating radar. Great, thanks. Um, so a question about what you can use the microgravity technique for. Um, do you use it for detecting um, any disturbances or habitats in the ground prior to construction? And could you use it um, if people were trapped in a mine underground? Could you use it to detect them? So at the moment we would use it for anything that's um, basically buried in the ground. So as I said, that's your, your sewers, your pipes, so it's probably something that is slightly deeper than the real shallow stuff that I showed in the early images, so your pipes and cables, because we do have our sewers, we do have our culverts, our drains, that are sort of three to five metres and we don't really know where they are and none of the other technologies really would find those easily subject to different ground conditions. Um, so that's something we would from an engineering viewpoint, but also to differentiate between different density soils. So if you um, get to a site and you want to use what's called pile foundations, you need to have something that they, like, like bedrock, they need to hit something hard. So if you've got really loose material around it, putting the pile in, you just lose the pile. So you can't put something heavy on top because there's no support from the ground. So you will want to know just variations in density of, of the ground. Um, can you ultimately detect paper lost in mines? Um, that's probably a bit of a stretch, but we're certainly looking at it, not from a civil engineering viewpoint, but whether you can detect it at sort of border security, can you detect things stored um, in lorries or so, which uh, you might not want to find, um, or you might want to find those things that should be there in, in things like that. Great, thanks. Um, what kind of width or strip sizes do the detectors give you? So how often do you have to move it to, to measure something? So it's basically, you're literally just measuring the value underneath your sensor. So it's, it hasn't got a horizontal uh, spread, so you have to move it. But you move it depending what feature you're expecting. So the deeper your feature is, the, the wider the sort of trough is that you can see at the, uh, uh, in your signal. So then you can space it a bit further apart. If it's quite shallow, it's quite a narrow trough and you obviously don't want to miss that um, peak signal. So it depends on what your target feature is and also depends on the size of the site. But at the moment we would do anything between sort of one meter grids is very tight. We probably don't do that very often, but sort of two, five, ten meter grids but again, this is where we're trying to use artificial intelligence to optimize the survey grid we're doing. So it's not just a regular grid. Um, you can actually plot the data as you go along and then that dictates where your next measurement point should be. Great, thanks. Um, do you know what it is that makes the machine so big at the moment? What's the, the issue to making them small? Well, it's part, partly it is to um, get all the electronics in, get the laser components in. Um, the other thing is there's a, a fine balance, but how far you want to separate your two um, atom clouds. Um, so how far your how long your baseline should be. So at the moment, a longer baseline is, is advantageous. 
for the for the way we are interrogating it at the moment but we are trying to shrink that baseline but also there's a lot of work done within the quantum technology hub to put um, instrument or put uh, components on the chip um, such as lasers on a chip or so so you're you're shrinking the components um, as well wow. um, and then a couple of questions have come in about like are there other uses that you could think of for this in the future could you use it to detect minerals in the ground and, and that kind of thing yeah, so that's what you would do at the moment. You can detect, um, so you would use a gravity instrument to detect minerals, to detect oil reservoirs, um, oil resources, gas. Um, we think we can use it to look at carbon sequestration. So when we pump carbon into the ground and we, we watch where the carbon moves, we think we can use it for groundwater or water monitoring. So that could be levels in reservoirs, but that could also variations in groundwater because again, it's it's a change in density, it's a change in mass in the ground, so anything that changes mass we can probably try and monitor. So that's from the sort of more engineering viewpoint. Um, you can put things in, there's a lot of work putting it on satellites and into space to look more at Earth, Earth observation, to look at flood inundation. So I think there are lots of different applications. Great. Well, it's got to half past, so thank you also for all of those questions. They were really great questions to ask Nicole as well. And I, I guess if people want to learn more, they can just Google Quantum Sensors Birmingham and there'll be various websites that, that will pop up that they can uh, learn some more about. I know there are some videos on YouTube as well from some some of the physicists on the on the, on the quantum side. So, um, and if anyone's struggling to find those, just get, drop me an email, I can... Uh, Point you in the yeah, right I, I just do the one slide because I, it was after my thank you slide. So there was a sort of useful web links or so, so I can always send them to you because there's some some projects we're working on from the civil engineering side. So you can see some of the applications. They all have websites, so you can have a look at those and, and get get to know a bit more. But just otherwise, drop us a line. You'll find the Quantum Technology Hub um, on the website and drop us a line, and we'll try our best to answer it. Wonderful. So thanks everyone for, for joining us this evening and thanks again Nicole, that was a, that was a wonderful talk. Um, and don't forget um, to join our Facebook group or check back on our website for any future events that we're running as well. So um, good evening everyone and I uh, hope to see you soon. Bye! <laughs>